That's the correct answer. You will not be here. So here's what that means because we only have a couple of classes before the exam. It means that I'm gonna to have to record some stuff. So I'm probably gonna record some things this afternoon. And here's what's actually kind of cool about this unit. So we're gonna move, I'm gonna make recordings for sensory, for the sensory, uh, somatosensory and the motor system. You don't have to know what's going on it's like it starts fresh you knowing about the visual system doesn't change your understanding of the somatosensory systems they're all kind of separate from each other so i will start filming those for you uh this afternoon so that you can get a jump on those now i will tell you that the majority of the exam is largely going to focus on vision and hearing so we should be able to cover that by next Friday for sure. But before we get started, I did want to show you and welcome everybody who is in. So happy to have you here, whether physically present or in the Zoom world. Um, I did go ahead and put up your take home essay questions and a study guide. So let's take a look. Oh, it was already down there. Shoot. <laughs> All right. So here are here are your essay questions. So Dr. Gilchrist wasn't lying when she said she was going to ask about on and off cells. So you're going to have to compare and contrast on and off bipolar cells using the following terms. Sodium channels, potassium channels, glutamate depolarized, hyperpolarized, and light and dark. You got to be able to cover that. Um, we are going to talk about this either today or on Wednesday, two disorders produced by damage to higher order visual cortex. Um, two are going to be associated with damage to the what pathway, two are going to be associated with damage to the where pathway, so you just have to pick two that you really understand. And then finally, per explain the proposed mechanisms by which we perceive pitch and spatial location of sound. There are two pro proposed mechanisms for pitch and three for spatial location. So these ought to be pretty straightforward. The study guide is up and it looks like somebody has already downloaded it four times. So, or four people have downloaded it. Somebody's like, I downloaded it 17 times, Dr. Gilchrist. Sure you, sure you did, sure you did. <laughs> I mean, maybe you did. I don't know. Um, so let's continue our discussion of, I believe we are still on 15. Maybe. No, I think we finished. We finished. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're not going to finish 16 today. I can tell you that because we just started here. So let's talk about what happens when information leaves the eye. Y'all good back there? So I will let you know, I do have somebody coming to sit in on my class on the 17th to see how I teach. Please be on your best behavior. <laughs> okay, so here is another look at the retinogeniculostriate pathway. Um, one easy way to remember what retinal fibers go where is to remember that the right side of each retina goes to the right lateral geniculate nucleus. So here's the right portion of the left eye, here's the right portion of the right eye, and they both go to the right lateral geniculate nucleus. The left portion of the left eye and the left portion of the right eye will go to the left lateral geniculate nucleus. Now, one of the things that you'll kind of notice here is that each of um, the information from each retina is segregated. So we have six layers of the lateral geniculate nucleus, and you'll notice, bless you, that uh, each of those is segregated in different layers. So even though we're getting inputs from both eyes, we're still keeping information segregated. The primary visual cortex is the very first place where information uh, is actually binocular, where cells are actually getting information from both eyes rather than just one eye. So 
So just as a reminder, contralateral means opposite. So in this case, the, le uh, the right retina is contralateral. It's on the left eye. Ipsilateral means the same side. <clears throat> And apologies in advance, I might occasionally be checking my phone for calls. I keep getting calls for potential appointments for vaccines and I keep missing out <laughs> and other people at work are getting theirs. So I'm kind of jealous and are you checking. On I am on every wait list. I am on, I have been on like multiple wait lists since February because I'm selfish. I want it and I hate being sick. <laughs> To give me something to look forward to, I did, uh, some of you already heard this in Sensation and Perception, but I signed up for the color run uh, in Kansas City in June. So hopefully things will be good by then. <laughs> All right, is everybody good here? Okay, so, oh, Rosa, did you need me to go back? Okay, um, so here is kind of another weird way to look at the visual cortex. So yes, this is what your, if we kind of cut off part of your head, it would look like this for you too. Um, so what you're kind of noticing, I wanna talk a little bit more about those nasal retinas and I wanna talk about those temporal retinal, uh, retinas. So your nasal retinas get input from the outer visual field on the ipsilateral side. So here's what that means. So here, we have our, uh, our nasal retina on the right. It is getting the outer portion of the right visual field, as you can see here. Here is our left nasal retina. It is getting the outer portion of the left visual field. Now, in contrast, your temporal retinas, so the ones that are close to your temples, are getting the contralateral visual field. So this temporal retina is getting uh, this portion of the visual field on the opposite side. So here, that is a right, uh, right temporal retina. It's getting the inner portion of the left visual field. And the right temporal retina is getting the inner portion of the left visual field. So there is no overlap of representation of visual space. We are not getting redundancies. Each retina is getting a slightly different part of the visual field, and none of this is shared. So here's what that means. If you damage your nasal retina, you will actually end up losing part of the ipsilateral field. So if I damage this retina, which is my left, gotta do that again, uh, I will damage the outer portion of my left visual field. If I damage uh, my temporal retina, so if I damage my um, right temporal retina, I will damage the inner portion of my left visual field. So if I damage a nasal retina, I'm losing part of the ipsilateral field. If I damage my temporal retinas, I'm losing part of my contralateral field. Yeah, contralateral and ipsilateral are always really tricky things to work with. I get that. So now we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the lateral geniculate nucleus. Well, I'm going to have to play the music that I wanted to play on Wednesday. It was a dubstep song that managed to work in the peanut butter jelly time song. So now you have to wait. <laughs> oh, no. Huh? Because it's awesome. That's why it exists. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the lateral geniculate nucleus. So by the once we get to the lateral geniculate nucleus, remember that we have already had complete crossover in the optic chiasm. So the left lateral geniculate nucleus will be for the right visual field. The right lateral geniculate nucleus will be for the left visual field. And by the way, I am recording this after class. Once it's done streaming, I'll send you all the link. So if you're having trouble with this contralateral and ipsilateral and right and left, this will be a nice refresher. Um, so one of the things that's kind of cool about the lateral geniculate nucleus is that information from each eye 
is equally represented. So there are three layers that are for the contralateral eye, and there are three layers for the ipsilateral eye. But notice that here, information from those two eyes is kept separate from each other in different layers. Now, interestingly enough, uh, different species actually have different numbers of layers and different types of arrangements. We have six layers. Uh, four of them are parvocellular layers and two of them are magnocellular. And in this picture, C stands for contralateral, I stands for ipsilateral. So if, yeah. Is it always in that order? Yes. On both sides? Yes. If this is the right lateral geniculate nucleus, the contralateral layer, contralateral layers are going to come from the left eye. And this entirely is going to be the left visual field. So the contralateral eye would be the left eye, the ipsilateral eye would be the right eye. And because this is the right lateral geniculate nucleus, it is responsible for our left visual field. So our magnocellular cells, as we kind of talked about, have those large receptive fields and they are not sensitive to color. They are effectively colorblind. Most of the input is coming from rods and these cells are critical for uh, processing motion. Our parvocellular layers have small receptive fields. They're sensitive to color. They also process form and most of their input comes from cones. Now remember that there were many more parvocellular cells than magnocellular cells in our retina. Consequently, we've got more parvocellular layers than magnocellular layers here. Peanut butter jelly, peanut butter jelly. Do the peanut butter jelly with the baseball bat. Peanut butter jelly. Oh gosh, now I won't quit. And now it's in your head too. I'm sorry. So wait, magnocellular is large receptive field and parvocellular is small receptive fields. They have they get their input from cones. And remember that cones have really low convergence. Anytime that you have low convergence, you're going to have a very, very small receptive field, but you're going to have a great use of detail. You okay, Magdalene? Okay, I didn't know if you had a headache or something, so I thought I was checking it. I, I thought I'd check in. All right. Does anybody need some more time here? Looks like some people are drawing pictures, so if it helps you. Yeah, Emily. Um, they're, they both process cones. I'm sorry. No, magnocellular magno inputs largely come from rods. Parvocellular inputs largely come from cones. Got it? Cool. Fantastic. Okay, so hopefully these don't look too unfamiliar. Hopefully these look pretty familiar to do, you. So our lateral geniculate nucleus cells have a very similar center surround receptive field organization, just like we see for ganglion cells. Just like our ganglion cells in the retina, these respond best to spots of light in the center and they fire fewer action potentials when light is diffuse across the receptive field. Because in that case, you are getting excitation from the center, but you're also getting inhibition from the surround. Um, here, the receptive fields are gonna be similar because each lateral geniculate nucleus cell only gets input from a few ganglion cells. So you're gonna see for our parvocellular cells, we have those uh, opponent process on off cells. So here's a red on center cell, here's a green on center cell and a blue on center cell. Our magnocellular cells are not color sensitive, so they're gonna respond to black and white. We can have um, part, we are going to also have those same on off receptive fields. So some of these will be on center cells, some of these will be off center cells.
anybody needs some more time? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the functions of the lateral geniculate nucleus. And there's a lot more that we need to know. Um, so one of the things that the LGN could possibly be involved in is enhancing information about color contrast. Um, and that's partially because we have multiple ganglion cells making contact with one LGN neuron. So it basically magnifies that information about contrast. It enhances it. The other thing that it could potentially be doing is organizing information by focusing upon eye of origin, focusing upon color or motion or form. My laptop scares me. It's about 10 minutes ahead. So I was looking at it. I'm like, it's already 143. What? I'm like, I haven't been talking that long yet. <laughs> and they keep trying to tell me, reset your computer and it'll reset the clock on your laptop. It doesn't. It just keeps, like last semester, it was maybe six minutes off. Now it's almost 10 minutes off and it's just going to keep getting longer and longer and longer, and at some point it's gonna be an hour ahead and I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> it would take a very long time for that to happen, at which point I will probably already need a new laptop. Okay, so are we feeling pretty good here? Are we ready to talk about some cortical areas? Are we ready to talk about some cortex? So just a reminder, so we talked about the retina, we talked about the lateral geniculate nucleus, and now we are getting into the striate part of the retino geniculo striate pathway. So here is your primary visual cortex, and your primary visual cortex actually has multiple names. So you are going to hear me refer to this as the striate cortex. You're going to hear me refer to this as the primary visual cortex. And sometimes I will also refer to it as V1. In this instance, the one stands for primary. So it's the first part of the cortex that processes a particular sense. And the V stands for vision. So we're gonna talk about this when we get to other primary cortices. So the primary auditory cortex is sometimes called A1. The primary somatosensory cortex is sometimes referred to as S1, and the primary motor cortex is referred to as M1. So just be prepared for me to use striate primary visual cortex or V1 um, in different terms, but they all mean the same thing. So the striate cortex is the very first place where input from both eyes uh, come together in the same cells. So most of the cells in V1 are binocular in nature. They actually process information from both eyes. Now, having said that, many of the cells in the primary visual cortex, despite being binocular, do have a preference for one eye over the other. They process both, but they sometimes uh, prioritize information from one eye over another. So each cell in the primary visual cortex has its own preferred eye. Yes. 
Is it based on like what you're seeing or like what your brain like? It's it's actually not about either of those things. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is that your uh, primary visual cortex actually has what are called ocular dominance columns. So you have these um, adjacent areas of columns where all the cells in this column have a preference for the right eye, all the cells in the adjacent column have a preference for the left. And when you actually stain for those ocular dominance columns, that's uh, how we call it the striate cortex. It has a striped appearance. So it's less about sensitivity or uh, what you're looking at, and it's more the structure of the cortex itself. Mm -hmm. um, why is this helpful for us? Why is what? Like, just like the strain of like. Why is ocular dominance helpful? Yeah. That is a very good philosophical question. Can we hold it until after class? <laughs> cool. All right. So. I think that's a really good question. Somebody asked me once why synapses exist, and I did not have a very good answer for them. <laughs> so I like these kind of questions. So in addition to uh, being binocular, because they receive input from both eyes, the cells in the primary visual cortex actually have very different receptive fields than the center surround receptive fields that we've talked about before. So if you were getting tired of looking at concentric circles, I've got great news. We're done with those. Um, Hubel and Weisel are scientists that recorded from neurons in awake animals in the primary visual cortex. They recorded the neurons while shining spots of light in an animal's visual field. Now, here's what's interesting. If you shine a spot of light for an awake animal, you get a lot of strong responses from cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus but they have no effect on cells in the primary visual cortex. Do you know what cells in the primary visual cortex like? They don't like spots of light. They like bars of light. They like stripes. And we're gonna talk about what Hubel and Weisel referred to as simple cells. Okay, <clears throat> so just as a reminder, so when we do a single unit recording, it kind of works like this. So we have an electrode in an awake animal's brain, which is being recorded. We are using a micro electrode so that we can actually get the activity of a single cell. We're going to project images onto a screen and so we can actually record the activity of cells while the animal is awake. All right. Hmm. All right. Are we good? Okay. So here's kind of something else you need to know. So because we are talking about the cortex, we're talking about six different cortical layers. Just like we have with the lateral geniculate nucleus, we actually have six different layers. Now, I know what you're thinking, Dr. Gilchrist, there are more than six layers here. Yes, you're right. We divide the fourth layer into three sublayers because the magnocellular and the parvocellular cells are still segregated in these layers. Most of the recordings that Hubel and Weisel did from animals was in cortical layer four, these three sublayers, because that is the primary input layer. So information from other parts of the brain enter the primary visual cortex at layer four. Layer four is always going to be your input layer. And Emily, to get back to answering your question about ocular dominance columns, 
We don't actually know why we have them. Um, it was believed that they would be important for binocular vision, um, but I found this on Wikipedia of all places. Squirrel monkeys do not have ocular dominance columns, which would not be expected if they were useful. So we don't actually know why. Um, this has led some to question whether they serve a purpose or are just a byproduct of development. So we don't actually know 100% why we have ocular dominance columns. We just know that we do. We've still got a lot to learn. That's a really good question, though. I had never really thought about that. I just, I always take for granted that we have them without thinking about why. So I always appreciate somebody who brings up the why. I know you can't tell under my mask, but I am smiling. <laughs> this class makes me smile a lot. All right. So here's kind of another way that we can look at those cortical layers. Um, by the way, if you are interested in color vision, uh, it is believed that these areas that are called blobs, which are typically in, the, oh no, it gets better. We have things in the secondary primary, secondary visual cortex that are called blobs. Uh, but we have blobs, which are believed to process aspects related to color. And then we also have interblobs, which we believe are for processing things like form. Um, so the magnocellular and the parvocellular inputs actually go into different layers. Um, they all input into layer four. So notice that they enter right here in, in different areas of layer four. So magnocellular tend to go into parts of uh, 4C and 4B. Your parvocellular layers look, largely go into a different layer of 4C, but then they kind of terminate, uh, magnocellular kind of terminates here, and our parvocellular inputs largely go into the blob, uh, blob section and the interblob section of layers two and three. But this is just another way of looking at it. I wish my cortex came in those pretty pastel colors. Okay, so. Let's talk a little bit about these simple cells. So remember, we're not really talking about a cell that responds best to a spot of light. In this particular case, we are looking at a cell that responds best to a bar of light or a stripe of light. And here's the other part that's really critical. Each of the simple cells in the primary visual cortex has a preferred orientation. That means it likes a line to be in a certain orientation. This is what we call an orientation tuning. So if we record from layer four, here is what we will find. Um, what we can kind of see here is that this particular cell has an orientation tuning for a vertical bar of light. It prefers a vertical line. So notice that uh, we get the greatest amount of firing and the most rapid firing when we present a vertical bar of light. Notice as we move farther away from that vertical orientation that the cell starts firing less. So notice that as we kind of move towards being less vertically oriented, we still get some firing, but not as much. And then by the time that we get to a horizontal line, we've got no firing at all. So this particular simple cell in primary visual cortex likes, I'm, I'm using air quotes because it's a cell, it can't actually like anything, but it likes zero degrees the best. It likes a line with a zero degree orientation. So where do these bars of light come from? How did we get from circles, little spots of light, all the way to a bar of orientation. It's actually pretty cool. Hubel and Weisel propose that it's because of overlapping LGN receptive fields. So check this out. So here is your primary visual cortex cell. It's getting a lot of different input from overlapping lateral geniculate nucleus cells, each with its own center surround circular field. And guess what happens when all of those overlap? You get a bar of light 
in a preferred orientation. So this is what is referred to as Hubel and Weisel's feed forward model. The overlapping circles here represent inputs to the simple cell from lateral geniculate nucleus cells. So each simple cell receives inputs from several lateral geniculate nucleus cells of the same type. So this simple cell will be stimulated maybe a little bit when a spot of light is shown on the center of its receptive field, maybe right here, but when the light is longer, like a bar, more lateral geniculate nucleus cells become stimulated and the response is gonna be larger. So this is how you get that bar of light. It's made up of overlapping inputs from the lateral geniculate nucleus. So only a bar of the appropriate orientation would simultaneously activate all of the input cells. And thus we get a maximal response in the simple cell. And now I'm about to make this a lot tougher because now we have to talk about complex cells. So I know you're laughing. You're like, these are simple cells? Dr. Gilchrist, what do complex cells look like? Well, guess what? You'll never have to draw the receptive field ever, 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 because we don't fully understand it. <laughs> okay. So complex cells are gonna be a little bit different. So these are found in other layers of uh, primary visual cortex. Here's what's cool. Um, these are gonna be in other layers besides layer four. They are actually the most common type of cell in the straight cortex. Now, like simple cells, they prefer line bars of light in a certain orientation. Like simple cells, they respond to a limited region of the visual field, but their behavior cannot be explained by a subdivision of excitatory areas and inhibitory areas. Here's why. Complex, complex cells respond best to moving bars of light in a preferred orientation. So notice here, We've got a line in its preferred orientation and notice that even when it's not in the center of the receptive field, even when it's moving, we still get a response as long as it is in the preferred orientation. So a long narrow bar of light will evoke a response wherever it is placed in the receptive field, provided that it's in the proper orientation. Complex cells are responsive to moving bars of light. The reason is because the cell can actually adapt and stop firing to the stimulus and moving the stimulus actually ends up preventing adaptation. You're constantly having to track a change. You're more likely to stimulate more simple cells by moving the light across the receptive field of the complex cell. Now, is moving light gonna do anything to a simple cell? No, it's gonna be a very brief response, but the complex cell can actually track that movement. So I'm not gonna ask you to draw this because it's terrifying, but here's a proposed idea for what the receptive fields look like. So here you have a very simple uh, receptive field for uh, a simple cell. Here's what it would potentially look like for a complex cell. So complex cells do tend to have larger receptive fields, but we don't know exactly how they're built up. Some think that the complex cell receives input from many simple cells, as you see in this figure here. Um, all fields have the same orientation, but they're spread out in an overlapping fashion. Um, it's kind of hard to draw, and I certainly won't ask you to draw this in, a, in an exam because as you can see, like even this isn't really drawn very well. But the basic message here is that complex cells are orientation selective because they get their input from simple cells that are also orientation selective. And when you put all of this together, you get multiple excitatory and inhibitory regions that allow you to track movement. So here is a nice review slide for you to write everything down. Hooray! 
I probably should have asked you an essay question about simple and complex cells. And you're like, thank you, Dr. Gilchrist, for not doing that. Peanut butter jelly, peanut butter jelly. It's never going to end. The peanut butter jelly is never going to end. That was my favorite thing to watch in college. Remember that these were the early days of the internet. We didn't have as much cool stuff as you did. All right, what, I see you're still writing, so let me know when you're done. Emily, Rosa, you need more time? Okay, anybody else need more time, Sarah? Okay, so one of the things that uh, we need to look at when we look at these different layers of the primary visual cortex, what you are viewing here is what is referred to as a hypercolumn. So a hypercolumn is basically made up of a one millimeter by one millimeter block of cortex. And the cortex can be, so these hypercolumns are basically about one millimeter squared, so length by width. There are 2,500 of them in the primary visual cortex, and they're composed of several functionally distinct columns. As we talked about before, because we are talking about the layers of the cortex, they have six different layers, different inputs and outputs. Um, and both eyes have inputs of, on the same sub layers of force. So notice that we have just as many inputs from the left eye as we do from the right. But there is some segregation such that contralateral and ipsilateral inputs arrive at different columns of the cortex. So these are your ocular dominance columns. So you have information from the left eye right next to input from the right, next to input from the left, next to input on the right. Cells there respond best to one eye or the other. Now, even though the cells in the striate cortex are binocular, as I mentioned, they still prefer one over the other. We don't exactly know why that is. 
Um, in addition to our ocular dominance columns, we also have uh, orientation columns. So these are made up of smaller columns that contain cells that respond to the same angle of light. They have the full um, neighboring columns are going to have similar orientation selectivities. So it's kind of hard to see here, but notice that this whole line of column has a preference for either 90 or 180 degrees. This whole section has a similar preference as well. So notice that uh, as you go down this straight, if you go down vertically, all the cells within this small little section of column will all have the same orientation tuning. So each, uh, we do have similar orientation columns linked with horizontal connections. A full 180 degrees are possible here. We don't have the full 360 because if you have 180, all you have to do is reverse it and you get the other 300, you get the other, uh, the full 360 degrees. Um, so there are some special columns that are called blobs. They do contain color sensitive cells. They are not sensitive to orientation and they are not well understood but they are believed to get inputs from uh, the parvocellular cells from the lateral geniculate nucleus, as, as well as the fourth layer of cortex. So let's talk a little bit about this orientation selectivity. So if we are looking at a particular section of hypercolumn, if we took an electrode and basically went through one section of the hypercolumn along a vertical line, we would find that all of the cells were tuned to the exact same orientation throughout all of these layers. If we penetrate that section horizontally, you are going to see a full 180 degrees of uh, orientation tuning across that cortex. Okay. Everybody good? Anybody need some more time? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about those ocular dominance columns and the striated coherence. So what you're looking at here is an image called an autoradiograph. This is really similar to an x-ray. So what you do is you use a radioactive tracer to measure where the cells are active, like we do with a PET scan. We're kind of looking at metabolic activity. So this is from V1. The dark and the light stripes represent our ocular dominance columns. So here's something that's not very happy. Um, the animal in this case that the image was taken from was stimulated in one eye uh, very quickly. Um, sacrificed, if you get my drift, and then an injected tracer identified which cells in the primary visual cortex were responsive. The dark columns are for the eye that was stimulated, and this is how we get the term striate cortex. Be kind to animals, y'all. <laughs> All 
All right. Oh, I'm sorry. So did they switch? Like obviously this one, the black and white, like mm -hmm. swapped um because of where it was stimulated. So right. if it was stimulated in the opposite spot, it was okay. Yes, you would get a switch if you had stimulated the opposite eye. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I found out yet another friend is getting a shot. <laughs> and I'm I'm here, my arms are shotless. <laughs> All right. So Let's talk a little bit about the straight cortex. So one of the things that I mentioned when we talk about light hitting the eye, when it's on the back of the retina, it's inverted. Um, because anytime that light goes through an aperture, it creates an inversion. Now, you do not see an upside down world. And part of the reason for this is that your brain actually understands this. And what ends up happening as a result, here is what your fovea sees. So here's the image on your fovea. When that goes to the cortex, it flips. So notice, for example, that the bottom portion of the visual field is on the top part of the cortex. The top part of the visual field is on the bottom part of the cortex. But here's what's really critical. There is, um, it, so we basically have a retinotopic map on the back of our cortex. But what's especially critical here is that a very sizable part of our fovea, a very sizable portion is represented on our cortex. So we actually have what is called cortical magnification. More of our cortex is devoted to the fovea than is to the periphery. So we actually have a retinotopic map of visual space on our primary visual cortex. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop here because it's about 2.05, it is about time to go. Um, I will probably be making a video, like I said, of the somatosensory system and the motor system. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to pick up anything from these lectures to take in with you. So I feel comfortable keeping those kind of separate. I think you should be able to understand them just fine. Um, and I'll start recording those, those this afternoon for you, okay? Have a great day. Um, and don't forget, don't be here on Monday. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend. Don't zoom in on Monday. <laughs>